Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. Digging up the executed King of France. Exhuming Louis the Sixteenth. One of the most shocking moments in French history was when the king, Louis the Sixteenth, was led towards the guillotine and the monarch was to lose his head. It was a shocking consequence of the French Revolution, and across the nation, the monarchy were very unpopular, as they were spending huge sums of money whilst people were starving. It was a terrible situation, but Charles Henry Sanson would be the man who operated the guillotine taking the head clean off the French king. But following this, his remains were later dug up decades after his execution, and they were then reburied. But what is the story of the exhumation of the French king? King Louis the Sixteenth was publicly executed on the twenty first of january seventeen ninety three at the place de la Revolution in Paris. His trial had concluded four days before, and it was stated that he was to be convicted of high treason, and he was condemned to death by a simple majority. Charles Henry Sanson, who was the high executioner of the first French Republic, had to be convinced to be the man who would take the king's head. But on the morning of his execution, he woke up early, and he was helped to be dressed by his valet before he met with an Irish priest named Henry Essex Edgeworth. The king made his final confession, and heard his last mass, and was given communion. But then Louis was advised by the priest to avoid a final farewell to his children, as it would be too heartbreaking, and then a carriage had arrived to pick him up. Final arrangements were sorted out as to what to do with the king's last belongings, and he then sat in the carriage that left the temple at nine o'clock with his priest and a number of guards. The carriage for more than an hour travelled with drummers playing along the journey to drown out any support for the king, and a cavalry force also made its way with the carriage, and they had their sabres drawn. 80,000 men at arms stationed to keep the crowd in control. There were talks of a last-minute rescue mission for the king, as in the neighbourhood of Rue de Clergy, a baron and supporter of the royal family, had summoned 300 royalists to try and help the king escape. He was to be hidden in a house, but eventually the rebellion and attempt failed, and three men were killed in this. But at ten, the carriage containing Louis the Sixteenth arrived at the place de la Revolution, and it came to a stop close to an area where the scaffold had been made, and on this guillotine was placed. This area was also surrounded by guns and drums, and many in the crowd were armed and they had pikes and weapons, but the king was then helped from the carriage and he was then led up the scaffold, and following this the executioner, Charles Henry Sansom, approached the king and asked his assistants to bind the king's hands together. The king at the first instance refused to allow this, and then he gave over as his handkerchief was used instead of a rope, and the executioners then cut the king's hair roughly and also removed the collar of his shirt. They did this to try and ensure that the guillotine blade would slice through his neck in a quick and rapid manner without any issues. After this, Louis tried to speak to the crowd, but he was drowned out by the drum roll that was ordered, and then the king was strapped to a wooden board. He was then slid under the guillotine blade, and Sanson then released the blade, and this then took the king's head off. One witness claimed that the blade did not cut the neck, but instead went through the back of his skull and into his jaw. It was an instant and brutal death, and then the executioner picked the king's head up from the basket and showed it to the crowd. There were some reports that he then dropped this into the crowd, and that the guards then rushed to it and dipped their handkerchiefs in his blood. The executioner's account would state, Arriving at the foot of the guillotine, Louis the Sixteenth looked for a moment at the instruments of his execution and asked Sanson why the drums had stopped beating. He came forward to speak, but there were shouts to the executioner to get on with their work. He was strapped down. He exclaimed, My people, I die innocent. Then, turning towards his executioner, Louis the Sixteenth declared, Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am accused. I hope that my blood may cement the good fortune of the French. The blade fell. It was 10.22am. 
one of the assistants of Sanson showed the head of Louis XVI to the people, whereupon a huge cry of Viva la nation! Viva la republique! arose, and an artillery salute rang out, which reached the ears of the imprisoned royal family. But this was not the end of the king's story, as his body and remains were then taken to the Madeleine Cemetery, where they were then buried quickly and hastily. One witness said of this, shortly afterwards the body of Louis was brought to the cemetery by a detachment of gendarmes on foot, who confirmed that the body was entire with all of its limbs, the head being separate from the trunk. We noted that their hair had been cut behind the head, and that the corpse was without neckerchief, coat or shoes. It was wearing a shirt, a quilted waistcoat, grey breeches and a pair of grey silk stockings. Thus dressed the body, was placed in a coffin which was lowered into the ditch. This was immediately filled in. All was carried out in accordance with the orders of the Executive Council of the French Republic. However, the body of the king would be exhumed. In 1814, the debate emerged about how possible this was, and the exhumation began on the 18th of January, 1815. The former gravedigger took part, and the Queen's remains would be found on the first day, and King Louis XVI would be found the day after. Marie Antoinette, Louis' Queen's body, was found rather easily, but the search for the King was not as easy. A deep trench was dug near the wall, and then the workers found several pieces of board from a coffin before they came across the skeleton of a man who had lost his head, and who had wounds to his skull. His head had been placed between his legs when buried, but despite no clothing being found, the witnesses claimed that they had found the remains of the king. They were completely convinced that this was King Louis XVI. Further officials confirmed this, and then their remains were transferred into a lead coffin. There has been some doubt as to whether this was the correct location, but the location was confirmed to have been roughly in the correct spot as to where the king was buried. The body was to be buried 12 feet down and covered in quicklime, and the remains of the king had been damaged by this, and the body was found at the correct depth. A further search did take place in the area at the same depth to make sure they had the king's remains, and there were not any other remains nearby. But the plan was to now bury the remains of the king along with his queen Marie Antoinette, in a more dignified manner, and in a place befitting their royal status. The Madeleine Cemetery had become too full, and because of this it had been closed. The bodies were then taken to the Basilia of St. Denis, and one eyewitness then recounts the service that took place for the king. It was said, Upon reaching the church of St. Denis, the bodies were taken from the car by the guards de la Marche, and carried into the church, where they were received by the clergy, and presented by the Bishop of Carcassonne, the Bishop of Air. They were then placed upon a lofty tomb of state in the midst of the choir. Monsieur, after retiring ring for a few minutes, entered the church and was followed by the Duke of Angloum, the Duke of Berry, the Duke of Orléans, and the Prince of de Conde, who occupied the stools on the right nearest the altar. The Duchess of Orléans, the Duchess of Bourbon, and Mademoiselle of Orléans entered the opposite stools. Next to the princes sat the Duke of Dalmatia, the Duke of Regio, and the court Bartholomew, and M. Lane, whom the king had appointed to support the pole when the coffin was carried to the vault. The other stalls were occupied by deputations from the court of Cassination, the court of Acom, the council of the university, the corps royal, the municipality, and the tribunal, de premier instance. The choir was filled by the great officers of the king's household, the officers of the prince's households, his majesty's ministers, the high personages appointed to form part of the procession, the marshals and peers of France, the deputies of the departments, the grand crosses of the order of the major general and staff of the national guards, the governor of the first military division and his staff, and a great number of generals and other military officers the governess of the royal children, the ladies-in-waiting upon her late majesty, and the ladies-in-waiting upon the Duchess of Angloum, sat upon the benches near the coffins. Four hundred young ladies of the Matian royal de Saint-Denis were seated in the front of the altar.
When all these attendants had taken their place, the service commenced. The princes and princesses, followed by the Grand Master and Master of Ceremonies, and their assistants approached the altar to present their offerings, after which a funeral oration was delivered by the Bishop of Troyes. The absolution having been pronounced, the bodies were lowered into the royal vault, into which Monsieur and two princes, his sons, descended and prostrated themselves upon the coffins of their royal relatives. Salutes of artillery were fired at the moment when the procession set out from Paris, during the service of St. Denis, and when the bodies were lowered into the vault. The execution of the King of France was a brutal and barbaric moment in France, but the discovery and reburial of his body decades later was also a shocking moment. He was a man who was considered the scourge of France, with his apathy for the suffering of his people, but today he lays to rest in a tomb that is more befitting of his title as a royal, rather than laying in a grave with no marker. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.